if I gave you this piece of code and asked you to write a test to make sure that it does the right thing, would you have any challenges? Hopefully not. It seems almost to be a trick question because this code is so trivial. Let's give you something a bit more challenging, even though the operation is still a plus b minus c. How would you write tests to make sure that this thing does the right thing? I ask you now to write tests for this code. So it's impressive how much of a mess we've managed to make with so few lines of code, and the question is, why exactly is this a mess? What makes this such a pain in the ass? So what seems to be the problem? Well, it's some shared interaction. The sharing is a problem. And the modifications are a problem. In example one, there's no sharing. A, B, and C, just there. Nobody else uses them. And A, B, and C, none of them are being modified. They just are constant as parameters as inputs. Nobody modifies them except this function. It doesn't even modify them. It just uses them. And it returns a value. So the modification seems to be a fundamental problem here, because if, it, if our floor is shifting under us as we are trying to stand on it, it becomes quite difficult. And of course, the sharing is also... Well, the sharing isn't a problem if things aren't being modified. But there's, again, if it is being modified, then sharing becomes a huge problem. Does this make sense? Modification seems to be the core of our problem here. I'll just list up the goals before break. Here are our code quality intuitions. Testable code is good code. Does anyone disagree with this? Because in that case, we will have to fight. <laughs> no, testable code is good. There's also a corollary to this, which is that untestable code is bad. I think that is also a reasonable thing to say. And here's my proposal, which um, might be a bit more uh, controversial. That, uh, well, that sentence is not complete. It's supposed to say, if the code is testable, it doesn't actually need the tests themselves. It just needs to be written in such a way that it is possible to test. Even then, it will be good code. The testing isn't the thing that makes the code good. It's the ability to test it that makes it good. Excuse the incomplete sentence that will need to be fixed. The code does not actually need the tests if it is written in a testable way. So then the question is, what makes the code testable? Well, let's see what our experience said from our little code slide. <coughs> the easy thing is, are these repeatable input-output relations. There is no hidden state, there is no things we need to assume the values of, there are no interactions with other parts, just straight input-output relations. And the hard part, where are these dependencies on the outside worlds? In this case, our, well, in this case, we had just some global variables or outside scope variables, but also external inputs like you need a user input in order to test it. Well, then you need a user in order to test it. You need the network in order to test it. Well, then your network needs to be working and configured in the way that you need it to be in order to test it. And so on also for disk. You actually need things stored on disk and so on. And we also have, this one's a bit more subtle, things that could be accessed but aren't, as in we need to assume that they are not being used by the rest of the system, but we can't guarantee it. And this is the giant problem with global variables is, well, since they're global, they could be modified from anywhere, which means that you need to know how everything works in order to make sure that it isn't being used inappropriately. So it's not just actual interactions, which is a problem, but also these potential interactions are also a problem for creating testable code. So here's our generalization of these hard to test things. Interactions, generally, including these potential interactions. Shared ownership, specifically shared modification. The outside world in general is hard to test because relying on the outside world is somewhat unreliable. Most generally, modification is the thing that is hard to test. So our code quality 
guideline from this point forward will be to avoid modification as much as possible, or at least isolate it in discrete, manageable chunks. After break, this pattern. Code can always be separated into these two parts, uh, finding out what action needs to be performed and then actually performing the action. What action, finding out what to do can often be, or can always be expressed as some kind of algorithm or some kind of pure function. It just returns, hey, this is the new state or this is the output that needs to be set. It doesn't actually do anything at all. And then performing the action, this would just be some kind of modification, writing over a variable, setting an output, and all other kinds of destructive behavior. And we can always perform this separation. And by performing this separation, we can isolate these hard-to-test parts. This performing the action part is the hard-to-test part, but now we can put all of our algorithms and all of our decisions into these easily testable parts and isolate them. So these core functions, these will always be only things with explicit inputs and outputs. No variables in outer scopes, no network, no disk, no communication to other threads or so on, no global variables, only parameters and return values. And these functions are what we would call pure functions. And these things that are modifying the outside world, these are usually called side effects. If we perform this divide, these functions will now contain all of the logic, so all of the decisions, the algorithms, the loops and conditions. This kind of code is therefore easy to test because it has no dependencies whatsoever. And then the other part would be this shell code on the outside which actually interacts with the outside world. And this outer shell, this will have to receive all the inputs, modify the states, modify the outputs. Where of course these core functions tell it what modifications should be done. And in this outer shell, all of our variables will go here, all of our communication goes here. Uh, and our shell shouldn't contain any, well, it can, of course, contain the outer big single while loop, but there are no other loops and there are no other conditionals. Or at least if you want a conditional, you can get, I'll give you one, but no more. But this code is, of course, hard to write tests for because it interacts with everything else. And if it interacts with everything else, you need to test everything else to make sure these interactions work out correctly. But since there are no loops, there are no conditionals, there are no algorithms here, no branches. Testing this kind of code is hopefully not really necessary because it's all just straight line code that just Gets, an, gets a decision and executes it from top to bottom, nothing else. So if we do things like this, we will achieve these things. We will achieve the separation of the decision, which is easy to test, and the action, which is hard to test. This lets us test these decision-making processes without actually having to set up and modify the outside world. This is a bit subtle. It lets us test the code with the data. We construct some data, send it into this decision algorithm, check that the result makes sense, and then get it back. So we apply the data to the function, this makes it, and get a result out, this makes it testable. The other way of doing things would be to have to set up the code that performs the action, and then also set up the entire world. So we need to test that the entire world is also set up correctly. And that way we'd have to test both the code and also test the data that we're sending in. That's a pain in the ass. It also transforms all of these world-modifying actions into trivial straight-line code that is isolated into a single place. And since it's straight-line, it doesn't really need a lot of testing. And it also integrates perfectly with our state machine pattern that we ended up with by doing things like this. And now we have a single line, which is our core. And inside that core, there's a decision performed in a pure function, and since it's a pure function, it's easily testable. I'll show you now the example implementation of the previous year's elevator project. So this is the uh, elevator state machine from the previous year's project.
we have these functions for uh, when a button is pushed. We, have, we switch first on the inputs and then we switch on the state. In this case, switching on the input is done by sending a value in a function. That's, not, that's just a restriction of the C programming language, sending a different... If we want to send different kinds of inputs, which have different data structures, we would either need to create a single data structure that can contain many different data structures, or we pass it as parameters to a function because functions can have different kinds of parameters without that ever really being a problem if they have different functions. So we have one function for uh, pushing a button, we have one function for arriving at a floor, and then we have one function for the door timing out. And inside these functions, this shell, as we've seen before, has very little conditions, very few loops. It has a single if here, a single if here, a single if here, and that's all of our nesting. There are no further loops, no further decisions being made here. All of the decisions being made are done here. Choose direction, should stop, uh, and when we get a button press, there are no, well, there are a few decisions to be made here. Again, choose direction. These decisions are made in these, in a different module, and they look like this. Choose direction takes in a piece of data. In this case, the elevator control contains the uh, elevator state the current floor, the current direction, and the table of what buttons have been pressed. So that would be the state and the data. And it returns a single piece of data. It doesn't modify anything. It doesn't interact with the outside world in any way. It's just the decision, just the algorithm. And similarly for this should stop function. Again, it doesn't modify anything. It just makes a decision. And finally, a bit more a bit more challenging, but at some point we need to clear the requests at, a current, at the current floor. And clearing the requests seems like a modification, because it is. But in this case, it's formulated differently. It doesn't actually clear anything. It takes in an elevator then returns a new elevator that has these requests cleared. So again, it's easy to test because it doesn't actually do anything. It just returns a new elevator data structure that has these elevators or has these requests cleared. Which again makes it testable because we don't actually need any requests to clear on any physical hardware in order to test that this thing does in fact clear the requests at this current floor depending on the algorithm chosen. So I encourage you to take a look at, at this in the project resources folder, the elevator algorithm for a single elevator. This one does not have the stop button implemented because then everybody taking the previous year's course could actually just go on the internet, copy paste the solution, and that would, wouldn't be a lot of fun. So it's only a partial solution for the previous year's project, and it is obviously also a, only a partial solution for this year's project because it doesn't have any networking and so on. But I encourage you to look at it just to get a feel for the structure of how to make a state machine in the, this C way. Look at how to do this core shell divide. See if you can separate out the actions and go in one place and the decisions go in a different place. And this will let you isolate all of these hard to test algorithms without actually needing to set up the outside world in any way. Next pattern. In our elevator projects in this course, we have a bit more of a challenge because it's larger. There's more stuff going on. Uh, there's not just a single elevator with doing its own thing. There are multiple elevators. There's a distribution element here there's a reliability concern when distributing 
requests. There's also the question of who is being assigned these orders. And it's going to be a lot if we take everything, all of our inputs from network and so on, and hardware, and all of our outputs also to the network and hardware, and we throw everything into one giant state machine. That's going to be a bit of a problem. So our goal here is to see if we can create something a bit smaller or individually smaller things than one giant god state machine and see if we can split it up into smaller parts. Chances are we're going to end up with more state machines that run in parallel because state machines seems like a reasonable solution for creating things that need outputs that depend on the order of inputs. For later, we're going to have to consider how these communicate or interact, but for now we just want to see if we can split them into separate state machines and consider this interaction component later. And from our testability concerns, the core problem that we wanted to avoid was this shared modification. So if we have two state machines that need to modify the same piece of data in a shared way, that's going to be a problem. Let's see if we can avoid it altogether. Uh, what we really want are these unique ownerships and unique responsibilities for pieces of data in order to just completely avoid this shared modification on testable hell. So let's see if we can split these data output responsibilities. Let's just first go through a couple of extreme scenarios for what it would look like if we split up things. The one extreme is don't split anything at all, put everything in one place. Let's look at the code quality challenges going on here. Uh, well, in order to use this core shell divide, we need to pass this data explicitly as parameters down to the core functions. That shouldn't be a problem. Just avoid global variables, pass everything as parameters. Um, and then everything is passed back up into the single god object, which then modifies its own local single state, which ends up being just one object containing what is effectively a set of semi-global variables. That's one extreme. That's, we're going to end up with a lot of parameters being passed around, or we're going to end up with global variables stored somewhere else. So uh, that's the icky. Let's get away from that. So let's go with the other extreme. Let's spread our data all over the place. So instead of grouping any amount of data, nothing is grouped. Everything is split into its own some kind of object. So in order to modify multiple things, or in order to modify anything, we need to first get it out of there. And then in order to modify it, we now need to ask multiple things to modify their own things, which means we need references to all of these pieces of data lying somewhere. So we need to now go all over the place in our code to get the things that we need, and then we need to go in other places of our code to modify the things that we need to modify, and we need to do it at the same time to make sure everything stays together the way it should. So these two extremes have two actually kind of similar problems. Putting everything together in one place, well, there's a lot of things being passed around. We need to pass everything around as parameters we need in order to make things testable. And if we have spread things, spread things out very thinly, again, we need to fetch everything by all of these references, we need to modify everything by these references. Again, there's a lot of things being passed around. So neither one of these extremes seems like it's uh, the appropriate solution. Of course, the solution must lie somewhere in the middle. The question is, when is it appropriate to spread things out and when is it appropriate to group things together? The challenge, shared modification. Shared modification can only happen if the data is spread out. If it's not spread out, it's not shared. So sharing implies that it's spread. The inverse of that would then be that grouping data is only necessary if the modification is shared. If you're modifying two things, but they don't need to be modified at the same time, they don't need to be grouped. They can be independent. 
And on the input side, duplicating data is only a problem if the duplicates need to be exactly the same all the time. If, the, if duplicates going out of sync isn't a problem, then duplicating isn't a problem. Things going out of sync will only be observable on the output side. If things are out of sync inside your program, but the output doesn't express some out of sync behavior, then that's not a problem. But our synchronization, our synchronizing our shared modification is already handled by grouping things that need to be modified at the same time. So if we then just scroll that argument back up, duplication is not going to be a problem if our modifications are grouped by the things that need to be modified at the same time. Or to put it another way, duplication isn't a problem if we are modifying things that can be modified independently. So duplication isn't the problem here. It's out of sync shared modification. That's going to be a problem. Conclusion being that we can get away with duplication. It's not really a problem, as long as we avoid shared modification. Which means that as long as we split our data and our output responsibilities based on if it needs to be modified together, in other words, dividing by the mutator, then we're free. This seems like a reasonable way of dividing up our system into different modules. If we need copies of other modules' data, then we can get those copies and it's not a problem. Duplication is absolutely preferable to overgrouping things into God objects. And then we can take each group of data and outputs and put them in what is most likely going to be their own state machines. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. You already have an intuition for this, but hopefully this puts it back into words. I suggest that this elevator system that you're creating can be divided into these three parts. Uh, a distribution part, which is you get an order, it needs to be distributed to the other elevators. Uh, an assignment part, which is you need to choose which elevator actually performs the action, and then an execution part, which is performing the requests, actually moving the elevator and so on. The distribution part, well, we need to know about the order in order to turn on the lights, but what we don't need to do is write to the state of the, uh, the elevator. We don't actually need to execute anything to, in order to distribute orders. And we also don't need to assign them in order to distribute them. And on the assignment side, in order to choose who does it, well, again, we don't really need to change the state of this current elevator while we are assigning. After it has been assigned, we have to do that. But while we are in this process of assigning, we don't have to do that. Uh, and we also don't need to worry about the distribution during this time either. Because we are currently assigning, we're not actually distributing. And then on the execution end, well, if we're doing it, we don't really need to worry about has it been distributed, because it hopefully already has been, and we don't need to know if it has been assigned to us, because if it wasn't, we wouldn't know about it. So we don't need to modify this assignment data, and we don't need to know uh, the distribution parts. Untangling distribution and assignment into two separate parts might take some effort, but I guarantee you that it is absolutely possible. However, uh, what might be, what might help you a bit here is that the order of the operations here does not really matter. Um, you can distribute first and then assign, or assign first and then distribute. Those are both equally valid solutions. Neither one of them has any advantage over the other one. It just changes the order of operations and, of course, the internal data representation needed to be able to do that. But I would suggest an opportunity here to divide the system into at least these three modules. 
just based on do these pieces of data needed to, in order to perform distribution assignment and execution? Do they need to be modified at the same time or not? Here's a more simple example, because of course this one is labeled example one, which implies that there is an example two. I want, for some reason, I want to implement the, an obstruction functionality for the door either by the obstruction switch manually, which I don't think is part of the specification yet, because it's taken out and not put back in, or I push the button and repeatedly push the button so that the door doesn't get to close because it's repeatedly being opened. Or both. My claim is, and the basis for my claim is that I've done this, is that this action can actually be created as a state machine a door state machine, which has some amount of states, which I would describe as something along these lines. Which means that the thing that actually moves the elevator and the thing that manages the door can be written as two parallel state machines. Doing this, if you don't need an obstructed door, well, that will give you a two-state state machine, door open or door closed, that's not really necessary. But if you do want obstruction, and if you want both kinds of obstruction, then it is actually useful to separate out the door as a separate state machine. And that state machine has the inputs of, hey, I want to open the door, and it has the output of, I was able to close the door, or I was unable to close the door for this reason. So it's a state machine with one input, try to close the door, and the obstruction switch, that's two inputs actually, and then two outputs, I managed to close the door, or I was unable to close the door in time. So this can actually be a separate state machine. Isn't that cool? We've managed to separate large things into small parts in ways that make them manageable and sensible. So let's look at what this pattern achieves. Parallel state machines means fewer total number of states. If you take the sum of states in one plus the sum of states in the other plus the states in the third one and so on, you will get fewer total states. That makes it more manageable. If it's smaller, it's easier to maintain because there's less stuff to have in our head at any single time. However, the total number of states in a parallel system is going to be larger because the states in one, since it's independent of the other one, now you get a product multiplying the states in one with the states in the other multiplied with the states in the third and so on. And this becomes a very large number very quickly. The question then is, uh, is that a problem? Is it a problem that the total number of states in the global perspective of the program is so large, is that going to be a problem? Well, hopefully not, because if we manage to manage these interactions between these parallel state machines and keep that under control, it doesn't matter what states the other state machines are in in order to test our single state machine. So it doesn't matter where we are in the process of executing an order in order for us to distribute some other order. Or it doesn't matter what the state of the distribution of some order is in order for us to execute an order. Since these are independent things and they communicate in a simple way of we managed to distribute it, here, it, here you go, here it's done, and you come back and say, hey, we managed to complete an order, here you go. Since that interaction is so simple, it doesn't matter that the total number of states in the system is very large. But it does rely on keeping these interactions simple. So of course, the next thing to worry about is keeping these interactions simple. What are our goals? Well, we need interacting state machines. In order for them to interact, they need some kind of interface, some kind of input, some kind of outputs between these state machines. The mechanism that we used so far in this C example for inputs was the input was a function call. 
a function call into a, an object. In this case, our object was just a file, which is the classic C way of doing pseudo object oriented programming. Uh, again, we want as few interactions as possible. If we have more interactions than necessary, what's the point? Uh, we also want no shared data because sharing was bad. We also don't want any references or shared references because references refer to data. So get rid of those pointers if you have them. Uh, and also, preferably, we want no synchronization. We want to be able for this, our local state machine, to interact with the outside world in a way where we don't need to worry about what state the outside world is in. If we need to worry about the state of the outside world, that's going to be a huge pain in the ass because now our interactions are based not just on us, but the in existence of state in the entire outside system. This is going to be a complete pain in the ass. If we can get away with no synchronization, that's good. So let's look at the two standard ways of doing these state machines. The one that you've seen so far is the objects, where the input event is passed as a parameter to a function. The one that you've probably started doing, who here is writing in a message passing language? Okay, let's put it in a different way. Who here is not writing in a message passing language? Curious. If I ask that question, I expect there to be first one set of hands and then the opposite set of hands, but I'm seeing situations where there are no hands. So I'm curious, what is this third operation? True, false, and file not found? <laughs> Who here is writing in a not message passing language? Cool, everybody's writing in a message passing language. <laughs> That's, well, well that, that would be nice because spoilers, that's going to be the correct solution anyway. Um, instead of passing it as a parameter to the function, we send a message in a queue or a channel. This is, you've all seen how to do this in Go in exercise one and two. So if we're going to do this with objects, an object contains like a classic OO object contains data, it contains the methods that manipulate the data, and then it contains the references to other objects in order to get access to their methods. Without these references to other objects, we can't get their methods. If we can't get their methods, and their methods are these functions that modify their state, then we can't interact with them. So we need these references. The process is a bit different. It has data, and then it has these input channels and these output channels. It doesn't actually have any references to other processes. It only has references or direct access to these channels. These channels don't actually access other. The channel just goes out to somewhere. What that somewhere is doesn't matter. So let's just list the problems with objects, because I have some, let's just call them objections. The object doesn't do anything. In order for an object to do anything, to perform as a state machine, someone else has to call these methods. Something else has to call these functions that are on event, do this. What that someone is, well, we'll have to figure that one out. If it's someone else doing it, well, that someone else is now responsible for performing the modification. The object itself isn't actually responsible for the modification. It's that someone else, because that someone else is the one who is actually doing it. We also get this problem that these objects can't run in parallel because they can't run. So someone else has to run them in parallel. I don't know how you would do that if one object communicates with another object by calling its method, then they're not running in parallel. Because one is calling the other one. And if two objects need to interact with each other, A needs to modify B and B needs to modify A, then they need circular references. And since accessing the method directly is 
an expression of your responsibility to modify that data. Now you have the situation of whose responsibility is it anyway? Is A responsible for modifying B or is B responsible for modifying A? Because A sure isn't responsible for modifying itself because it can't do any modification. It doesn't do anything. And then we have this different problem where exposing one kind of interaction exposes all of them. You have this interface. If you get access to one method, you get access to all of them. There is no way to say this object exposes this function to this other object, but this third function to this other other object without also enumerating what those objects are. You can kind of do this with friends, but you need to friend something. So if you get access to one public method, you tend to get access to all of the public methods. And then finally, testing these interactions in order to interact with another object, you actually need another object. And if you want another object that hasn't been made yet, or you want something that replaces the real thing in order to make testing easier, you need to make a test replacement. You need to make a double, you need to make a mock, you need to make a white hole, something that lives on this other end, something that this thing, something that our object can call. Processes are different. We're talking Go routines, for example. It's some kind of thread, so it actually does something on its own. It actually runs. So it is now responsible for its own modification because nobody else has to call any functions to modify it. They're connected with these queues and these channels, which means that on the other end of one of these queues, there doesn't have to be anything real. It can be your test framework. And the modifications that are being performed, if we get an input, the one who is sending the input isn't actually modifying us, it is just sending a request to modify us. We can also expose single channels instead of the entire interface. And since we can expose single channels and there's nothing on the other end of these channels, we only need this process in order to test it. We don't need the full interfaces of everything else. We don't need anything on the other end at all, except our test framework. So let's see, if we have an object, I don't know if this is drawable, called A, it has the functions the functions F and the functions G. This would be like on button press and then on floor arrival or something along those lines. In order for uh, let's make this let's make this the thing that executes the order and let's make B the thing that gives it orders after it having been distributed. So if uh, let's see, let's rename them to uh, uh, then thing that executes it gets a new order it gets a floor arrival these are the kinds of interactions that our objects can accept and then we have this distribute part And this one can get uh, button press either from the hardware or from the network, and then it can also get a completed order. Uh, now our interface here, these are public functions to our objects. In order for the distribution system to be able to tell the execution system that it has an order, that it should execute an order, it needs to be able to call this execution system. In order to call it, it needs access to it. To get access to it, it will need a reference to it, which means that it will need an execution system reference pointer type thing. This distribution system only needs to tell it about new orders. It doesn't need to tell it about floor arrivals but it will get the ability to tell it about floor arrivals 
because it's part of the public interface. It's unavoidable. This execution system wants to tell the distribution system that it has completed an order, which means, you guessed it, as part of its data, it needs a distribution system pointer. Now the distribution system tells it to execute a new order. The order is executed immediately because it's at the correct floor. It tells it that it's completed. Who is actually responsible for modifying the order distribution? Well, is it this one, or is it this one, or is it both? They're both responsible for everything. Oh, and also this execution system can tell it about a button press. Why would it need to do that? It doesn't. But it's unavoidable because of these all or nothing public interfaces. So we get these circular pointers. We get access to these methods that we don't need access to. Neither of them actually do anything. They're both responsible for each other. We have shared modification. We're back where we started. And how do we even populate these two when they need pointers to each other? How do we even initialize this kind of system? Let's write it in a message passing way instead. Distribution system takes in a button press, takes in a completed order. We have an execution system. It takes in a new order. It takes in floor arrival. It also sends out completed orders. And this distribution system also sends out new orders. These processes are not connected yet, because making the process doesn't connect them. It only has these channels. It doesn't have references to other things. In order to make the system work, we actually have to explicitly create these connections somewhere else in our system. Usually that would be main, creates processes and con sets up the channels. But in order to test each individual system, well, if we want to test it, we just say, we just disconnect this part, disconnect them, and then we take our test part and just route it straight into our test part. And in order to test it, we didn't have to change any references. If we wanted to test this object-oriented system, we would have to change this from an exec pointer to an exec test pointer. Or we would have to create an exec test object. Camera challenges? Well, we are having one or two little problems at the moment. It won't be too long before we're with tonight's episode of... All right. Is it clear now the differences between an object-oriented system and a message passing system? Is it clear now the advantages of being able to not worry about these references, that the modification is actually isolated to the thing that actually does something, having these processes actually do something, having these B threads that can actually run in parallel, having to not worry about the state of another system because we don't actually interact with the other system, we just interact with our channels, which happen to be connected to another system. These are all massive advantages for a message passing queue or channel based system. I also think I have, this is speculative and might be controversial, but I think I have discovered why object oriented programming happened <laughs> as a mistake. I think there was a misunderstanding where they thought that there was a duality between function and data. But in fact, that's not the case. The duality is between execution and data. Because functions are descriptions, which is data. And data doesn't do anything. The challenge that needed to be solved was that modification is being performed. The execution and the data is the split that needs to be done in order to solve the challenges of code quality, not function and data. I think 
I, I, it also seems to line up with history because execution was something you only had one of, a single core. And the way that we used to do things back in the super old days was direct memory modification over parallel buses. These days everything is indirect message passing over serial buses to external hardware components. In fact, the interactions between the different cores of your computers is a message passing network between these cores. And now that we get into this multi-core and also like hyper multi-core like graphics processors and so on, we're starting to see that the problem is shared modification and the challenge is execution and data, not function and data. At least that's what I, that's, it's speculative, but I believe this is the case for now, until um, proven otherwise. So finally, let's just look at what this pattern achieves before we finish for today. It allows testing of single processes without setting up other processes. We can connect directly to test frameworks. We don't need to create our own test doubles. If we want to test this one, we don't actually need to figure out how to mock this floor system, but if we were to do this with an object-oriented system to create a test double of this one, it needs to fully, fully implement the interface, so it will also need some floor arrival functionality that does nothing. That's just bookkeeping that we don't need. It also eliminates these potential interactions by exposing this partitionable interface where we only need one of them, we don't need all of them. Uh, we can connect these different queues and channels to different places. We don't need to connect everything to everything like you would with the object-oriented system. Uh, there's no need for explicit synchronization between the processes because everything is sent as values over channels. The copies being stale isn't a problem because we solve this by partitioning by who modifies what. And it also has this nice little thing that we'll get to later by making the within program communication follow the same pattern as between program communication. How do you send things over the internet? Well, it sure is not by sending pointers, it's by sending values. So if we can do the same thing by sending values within our program, good, it reflects the rest of the system as a whole. 